Excellent. Good evening again, uh, and welcome to Francis Marion University and our retrospective on the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And it's, it is my pleasure um, this evening to welcome uh, Mark Updegrove to campus. Uh, Mark Updegrove is the director of the Lyndon B. Johnson Presidential Library in Austin, Texas, where he has been since 2009. Uh, as a presidential historian, Upta Grove has published uh, three books on the presidency, including an oral history of the LBJ presidential years um, titled Indomitable Will, LBJ and the Presidency, which was published in 2012. Uh, before taking his role at the LBJ Library, Mr. Updegrove served as the U.S. publisher of Newsweek, president of Time Canada, and manager of Time Los Angeles, among min many other jobs. Uh, as we were chatting earlier, he has lived in South Carolina uh, in Charleston, so welcome back to South Carolina. Uh, he is going to talk about the leadership of Lyndon Johnson uh, during not only the Civil Rights Act, uh, during, but during the entire Great Society era, um, and uh, it is my pleasure to welcome him to campus. Mr. Updegrove. Thank you very much, Alyssa. It's good to be back home, in a way. I, I chose South Carolina to live. I would bounced around a little bit in my career, and uh, I've been at the major cities. I was in New York City, I went to San Francisco, I went to, to Los Angeles, I went to Toronto, back to New York, and I thought, uh, I want to live in South Carolina. This, this country just speaks to me, and I love South Carolinians. And then the LBJ Library beckoned, and it was a job that I, I just couldn't refuse, being the director of the LBJ Library, for, for reasons I'll talk about in a moment. I'm now a presidential historian. I wasn't always a presidential historian. I, I came to that later in my career, that the presidency had always been a passion of mine. And I'm reminded of a story of uh, Richard Nixon, who had uh, squared off against John F. Kennedy in 1960 in what was the most narrowly contested presidential election in our history to that point. Uh, Nixon had been vice president for Eisenhower for eight years. He proved to be a formidable competitor, but he came out on the losing end of the 1960 election. And as Nixon was leaving John F. Kennedy's inauguration in January of 1961, one of Kennedy's speechwriters spotted him, and they began chatting. And Nixon said, you know, I, I wish I had said some of those things. And the speechwriter said, you mean the part where uh, the president said, uh, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country? And Nixon said, no, the part where he said, I do solemnly swear. <laughs> I, I love that story. It happens to be true. But I love that story because it shows to me that every man who takes the office of the presidency wants to put his own stamp on it. They have their own agenda. They have their own vision. And that is certainly true for Lyndon Johnson. One of the reasons I wanted to take this job is because I felt that Lyndon Johnson was a largely underappreciated American president. He wasn't getting his due in history. I've been out at the job for five years. And everybody who knows Lyndon Johnson has a story of LBJ. And one of my favorite stories uh, came from one of his speechwriters, who was crafting speeches for him when Johnson was a senator from Texas. Johnson was about to go back to the Lone Star State to campaign for re-election, and he was looking at a draft speech that his speechwriters had uh, come up with. And Johnson's perusing it, and he comes across a passage from Plato. And he looks and he says, Plato? He says, Plato. Now let me get this straight. I'm going back to Texas to talk to just plain folks, and you have me quoting Plato? He said, keep the quote, but start it with, my daddy always used to say. <laughs> I had heard a lot of things that were said about Lyndon Johnson, and I myself had my own misconceptions about LBJ. 
I want to ask you all, what is the first thing you think of when you think of President Lyndon Baines Johnson? Just shout him out. Vietnam. Vietnam. LBJ all the way. The campaign slogan from 1964. Anyone else? Picking a beagle up by his ears. Showing a scar. Uh, the, more, the, the more unflattering moments of the Lyndon Johnson presidency. Anything else? Civil rights. Civil rights. Medicare. Medicare. The car with the, uh, gun <laughs> the car with gun pockets in it. You know, I think that's right. And uh, all those things are, are accurate. But I think you said it right first. The thing that LBJ was most known for, for me, was Vietnam. It was the, ultimately the conflict that defined his presidency, at least in the early years after he left office. That seemed to be what we would remember most about LBJ is Vietnam. That's a fair part of his legacy. What I didn't appreciate until I started delving into presidential history was how transformative this president truly was. And like you, I, I thought about Vietnam when I thought about LBJ. I thought about the crudeness of his public image. The guy who was hoisting up his beagle by his ears saying, it's good for him. And the guy who was showing his gallbladder scar to the press. He had a, a very, very unflattering image. And if you compare him to his predecessor, the very graceful John Fitzgerald Kennedy, he, would only, he was only going to be in the losing end of that comparison. LBJ himself knew that when he took the presidency. He knew he was succeeding a man who he called a great public hero. And he knew that would be a very, very difficult task. But LBJ had some remarkable skills that were not afforded to John F. Kennedy. And he had great vision. And I believe Teresa Cosby talked about this earlier, and she teed this up very nicely. She talked about LBJ being a product of the New Deal. He was in Washington in 1934 working for a congressman, and then he went on to earn a seat in Congress in 1937. And so he came to prominence in politics under the FDR administration, under the Roosevelt administration, under the New Deal. And he saw what government could do to lift up those who were disenfranchised, who were impoverished, who were on the losing end of American society. And that stayed with him. But one of the things that reveals Johnson most and informs why he had such a grand vision for what he might do when he got the presidency in his own right happened earlier in his life. When he was a teacher at a small college in Catula, Texas. That left an indelible impression in his mind. In 1965, uh, Johnson presses for voting rights. What we didn't talk about earlier is we, we talked about the fact that the, voting, the, the Civil Rights Act had a voting rights provision in it. It was stripped out of it. And LBJ was complicit in seeing that, that very potent voting rights aspect of the Civil Rights Act slip away. He was complicit in that. And any idea why? Well, politics is, is the right answer. Because LBJ was a master of the legislative process. He knew instinctively what it would take to get legislation through. He had the uncanny knack of being able to read his, the, the, the people on both sides of the aisle and know what motivated them. And he knew that if he tried to push a Civil Rights Act, which would break the back of Jim Crow, but that also had a potent voting rights component, that it would be too top heavy. That it would collapse of its own weight and we wouldn't get anywhere. So he took a very incremental view toward civil rights. Let's first get rid of this sec separate but equal doctrine, this oxymoron that is polluting parts of our country and holding us back from our promise. That's the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And then he decides, then let's get the Voting Rights Act. 
when we have the momentum, when we have the chance, let's push voting rights through. And then there was a, 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 a third in a triumvirate of civil rights legislation that he pushes through at the end of his term called the Fair Housing Act, also called the Civil Rights Act of 1968. That was a triumvirate of civil rights acts that, that had eluded every other 20th century president. So the first thing I'm going to play for you is LBJ, after having passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, making a plea the following year to many reluctant lawmakers to push through the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And this clip, I think, not only shows LBJ's, uh, illuminates a, a formative experience in his life, it also shows his resolve to get things done and to use the power of the presidency to do it. My first job after college was as a teacher in Cotula, Texas, in a small Mexican-American school. Few of them could speak English, and I couldn't speak much Spanish. My students were poor, and they often came to class without breakfast, hungry. And they knew, even in their youth, the pain of prejudice. They never seemed to know why people disliked them. But they knew it was so, because I saw it in their eyes. I often walked home late in the afternoon after the classes were finished, wishing there was more that I could do. But all I knew was to teach them the little that I knew hoping that it might help them against the hardships that lay ahead. And somehow, you never forget what poverty and hatred can do when you see its scars on the hopeful face of a young child. I never thought then, in 1928, that I would be standing here in 1965. It never even occurred to me in my fondest dreams that I might have the chance to help the sons and daughters of those students and to help people like them all over this country. But now I do have that chance. And I'll let you in on a secret. I mean to use it. I'm not sure any president has ever said anything that was more illuminating than that, that was more personal than that. And use the power of the presidency he did. I'll talk about civil rights in a moment. Um, but uh, before I leave the topic, Johnson gets the presidency upon the assassination of John Fitzgerald Kennedy in November of 1963. And he realizes that Kennedy has proposed the Civil Rights Act the summer before in June. It wasn't going anywhere in the halls of Congress. And LBJ knew that. And, and I'm not sure that, that John F. Kennedy had the political will or the political force to get it through. That remains to be seen. But Johnson did. And his people come to him, his aides, and they say, Mr. President, we think you should wait to push through the Civil Rights Act. And we think you should wait because it's going to cost you politically. Go through 1964, campaign for the presidency, earn it in your own right, and then in 1965, when you have political capital, use it towards civil rights. And Johnson hears them out, and he says, what the hell is a presidency for? What the hell is a presidency for if you can't use it to do something meaningful? And Johnson knew what the Civil Rights Act would mean, because he saw poverty and bigotry and hate, not through the eyes 
of African Americans, but through Mexican Americans in his home state of Texas. And he, he related to them. Johnson had grown up in poverty in Johnson City, Texas, in this little town in central Texas, living for much of his youth in poverty. But he hadn't seen bigotry until that experience, and it shaped him. But Johnson's view, his vision of a great society went well beyond civil rights. I'll talk about Johnson's legacy in a moment, but I will tell you that when Johnson became president, he didn't want to be known as the Vietnam president, certainly. He didn't want to be known as the civil rights president. He wanted to be known as the education president. Because Johnson believed firmly that if everybody in this country had a good access to education, there would be no need for civil rights because there would be no barriers to entry, to opportunity, that people could fulfill their destiny simply by the, the education that they received. And I think, again, that experience as a teacher informed LBJ. This is, um, I'm going to play some conversations that, showed how, that show how LBJ operated. The uh, LBJ taped 643 hours of phone conversations during the course of his presidency. They are the crown jewels of the LBJ Presidential Library archives. And they, more than anything else, give you a clue as to who this guy was and what a force of nature he was. This first conversation is with Adam Clayton Powell, who was a congressman from, uh, from Harlem. And uh, uh, this is when, in 1965, Johnson has earned the presidency in his own right with a landslide election in 1965, uh, despite passing the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which cost him dearly in the South. He lost uh, five of the eight southern states, plus the state of Arizona, but still won in the greatest landslide election in American history, garnering 64% of the popular vote. Johnson realizes that he has this opportunity in 1965 to get through his agenda. He realizes he has this mandate from the American people to carry forth the laws of the great society. But he also knows full well the ephemeral nature of political capital. And before it evaporates, he's determined to get through everything he possibly can. And one of the things he wants to get through is the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which puts a profusion of federal dollars into our education system for the first time, putting many schools on a higher plane, and in some cases on an equal plane. This was particularly important in the segregated South, in what was the segregated South, giving those schools that had been, uh, and still were, uh, pr principally uh, populated by African Americans, giving them federal funds to, to raise the level of education. So it's an incredibly important act of legislation. Interestingly enough, Adam Clayton Powell, an African-American congressman, has stood in the way of the elementary and secondary education for political reasons, because he's trying to get something out of it. And you'll hear in this conversation, that doesn't sit too well with the 36th president of the United States. How's my friend? Fine, Adam. What the hell's been happening to your committee? I thought you told me two months ago that you were going to pass a bill for me. That's right. Well, what happened? All hell is broken loose because... Well, uh, what the hell are you blackmailing me on a... Right, well, the hell you didn't. You on a $400,000 appropriation for you. We couldn't pass a billion, 200 million for the school kids. Now, you know I'm for you, and you know that uh, I'm going to help you any way I can. I've got nothing to do with what you're doing in the House investigation, but you've damn near defeated the best education bill I've got, and I right. hope you're going to be proud of it. No. Now, uh, do you know in the Appalachia bill that there is... Well, Appalachia ain't got a damn thing to do with you. It's you handle your committee and let us handle the other one. Yeah, but there's a clause in there, Mr. President. Yeah, there's a clause been in there all the time, and if you're going to let if you're gonna let heirs and eat of the green lead you off the reservation. Well, then I ran for nothing last year with 15 million votes. Johnson wasn't one to take no for an answer. Uh, I think the, uh, the panel, uh, wonderful panel earlier, they talked about the arm-twisting abilities of Lyndon Johnson. He, he flattered, he cajoled, he, 
He threatened, he did anything he could to get legislation passed, even to the most reluctant of opponents. He just had an uncanny knack of understanding what made them tick and what would motivate them to say yes to what he wanted. This is a, a conversation that LBJ has with his vice president, Hubert Humphrey, a great, uh, a, a, a great champion of, of civil rights. And in this case, he's asking John, uh, to, uh, LBJ to help, or sorry, LBJ is asking him to help pass the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. What's interesting about this conversation is LBJ is giving him a political education. He's telling him exactly what he needs to do to get people to support this bill. It's a wonderful conversation, again, showing the political skills of LBJ. I told Martin Luther King, I said, hell, I'm for voting, and we're going to get voting. That's not your problem. You're going to have a vote message, and it's an issue that we can do. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the big thing, Dr. King, with you is a billion, two hundred million for Negroes only. Because who the hell do you think makes less than 2,000 a year? It's the Negroes. Now, thank God they can't work in a filling station, put water in a radiator unless they can read and write. Because they got to go and punch the cash register. And they don't know which one to punch. And they got to take a check. They don't know which one to cash. And they got to take a credit card. And they can't pull the numbers. So you got to teach them read and write. Now, that's what you damn fellas better be working on. And if these Republicans want to be for the Negroes, and I hope they do, I want them two-party system. I hope some Negroes vote for Republicans. But you make them go vote for education. And uh, I think you ought to find out this group that's meeting with Ms. Green and as Vice President of the United States, you ought to ask two of them to come to your home on Sunday afternoon. You ought to have two of them at breakfast with you on Monday morning. You ought to have two of them in your office in the afternoon and give them a card to the gallery and give them a picture of you and your wife and give them one of the president and then tell them that this is the greatest thing and their names are going to be uh, built to uh, be written in fire on uh, every schoolhouse in the country that they made the breakthrough. And the Pope don't get a damn thing out of this but a pencil. And then the school board's got to give it to him and that you're a Protestant and that uh, this is the best thing you've ever seen because if you can't do more than old lady green, I'm in a hell of a shape. I ought to have had her. Not yet, sir, Mr. And if I, she'd been a little younger, I might have picked her. Old Lady Green was, as he's referring to her, stood standing in the way of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, in part because it supports parochial schools. And they thought it gave Catholics uh, sort of an intrinsic advantage. So that was standing in the way of things. So they're trying to figure that out. But I love that conversation for two reasons. Number one, well, three. Number one, you hear this polit political education that LBJ is giving, which is so wonderful. Two, I love that LBJ says, I want some Negroes, African, the term for African Americans at the time, to vote for Republicans. He realizes the value of a strong two-party system. And I also know, I love rather that he knows what's, you know, that what that guy in the filling station is going to need to succeed to do his job. Johnson knew that. He knew poor people. This, his, his presidency was very personal. And he knew what, the, what was going to make their lives better. And indeed, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act passed in 65, and also the Higher Education Act, also passed in 65, were truly transformative. They, you see with the ESEA that high school graduates soar by 18% in five years. You also see that college matriculation rates soar by about the same amount in the same time due to the Higher Education Act. Truly transformative. So Johnson, you can hear there, wants to be the education president. He says, I told Martin Luther King, I'm going to get your Voting Rights Act. But the very important thing for you now is get African Americans educated. Let's give them the best education you can possibly give them. He wants to be the education president. The uh, this is a conversation regarding Medicare. So education is one very important component of the great society. Another very important component is health care. Medicare had been contemplated by Franklin Roosevelt during the New Deal. He wanted to put it in the Social Security Bill. He wasn't able to do it. 
He thought it would make Social Security too top-heavy. It was a cause that was uh, brought to the fore by uh, Harry Truman, who was unsuccessful. It was defeated. John F. Kennedy thought about Medicare, but couldn't get it through. Johnson realizes it's desperately needed. At the time, this is not just a health care bill. This is an anti-poverty bill. We don't realize it today. But about a third of all Americans over 65 were living in poverty, unable to afford the most basic medical needs. Johnson knows this. He finds it deplorable. At the time, there was a term. I don't know if any of you all have heard this term, but he's gone over to the poorhouse. Somebody was elderly, he would go to a facility. He would say, yeah, he's going over to the poorhouse. What that essentially meant is that he went to a facility in order to die because he or she did not have access to the proper medical care. So Johnson tries to push through Medicare in 1965. This is a conversation that he has with a, a lawmaker where uh, He's talking about how to get the thing through, and the fact that you've got to seize the moment to get the law through now, or else it's going to fall by the wayside. He realizes this is the moment. Here's that conversation. When are you going to take it up? With, uh, I've got to go to the rules committee next week. You, you always get your rules pretty quick, though. Don't yeah, you? that's right. Uh, we could have it on late next week, probably. Thank you. Thank not you. early in the following week. God's sake, let's get it for Easter. Oh, I will. What they do is... No doubt about that. It's going what to they do, What they do, and you've got two or three little measures that uh, you might not take too long on uh, uh, that give us trouble. They make a poll every Easter. They've been doing it for 30 years. You know it. And what has accomplished it, Congress accomplished up to then. And the rest of the year... They use that record to write editorials about. So anything that we can grind through before Easter will be twice as important as after Easter. So much obliged. Much obliged. Well, now, remember this. Nine out of ten things that I get in trouble on is because they lay around. And tell the speaker and... Wilbur, to please get a rule just the moment they can. They want to, get, they want to bring it up next week, Mr. Yeah, President. but you just tell them not to let it lay around. Do that. They want to, but they might not. Then that gets the doctors organized. Then they get the others organized. And I damn near kill my education bill letting it lay around. Yeah. It stinks. It's yeah. just like a dead cat on the yeah. door. When a committee reports it, you better either bury that cat yeah. or get it some life. <laughs> The ever colorful LBJ is saying it stinks like a dead cat. You got to get it off your porch. Uh, you you got to strike while the iron is hot, is what he's saying. And he does get Medicare through in 1965 and signs it at the Harry Truman Library uh, as the uh, as the 34th president looks on and, and LBJ or sorry 33rd president looks on and LBJ pays tribute for Harry Truman for taking up the cause that many years before, and it was a wonderful tribute to, to, to Truman. Today is much about civil rights. Uh, I mentioned that LBJ wanted to be the education president. Uh, I think ultimately he was remembered uh, when he left office for Vietnam. But I think he will ultimately be remembered for civil rights because as the panel alluded to earlier today, no civil rights legislation had been passed in this country since Reconstruction, since 1875. Nobody takes up the cause of civil rights. FDR doesn't do it because he's afraid he'll lose Southern Democrats and support for his New Deal programs. Harry Truman tries to take up civil rights, can't do it, can't get anything through Congress. What he does as president is desegregates the military which was mentioned earlier on the panel very articulately. Uh, Johnson, ch or sorry, Truman changes the face of the U.S. military by, by integrating the forces. He feels he owes that to returning African Americans after the sacrifices they made in World War II. Tremendously controversial at the time. But he can use his authority as president and, and uh, uh, as, as commander in chief to do that and he does it with a stroke of a pen. Eisenhower doesn't do much 
on civil rights he does, uh, helped to quell the situation in Little Rock in 1957 as nine students integrate Little Rock High School and are repelled by Governor uh, Orville Favis's National Guard. They prevent them from entering into the school in 1957. A crisis, a standoff occurs. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an international, uh, a crisis of international proportions because all over the world there are images of the National Guard preventing African American students from attending school. Well, Eisenhower realizes we can't have this. And I believe it was mentioned again on the panel very astutely that uh, this was becoming a foreign policy crisis. At a time when we were trying to exert our moral authority in the face of what was going on with the Soviet Union, trying to, uh, to, to wield its influence in the world, we were looked upon as not having any moral authority ourselves because what was written in our Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal, was not present in this country. It was, it was the greatest contradiction. And so Eisenhower realizes he needs to do something about it. And what he does is he takes the, the Arkansas National Guard and he federalizes them. He makes them under his command. And he also brings in the 101st Airborne. And they effectively help integrate uh, Little Rock High School in 1957. Kennedy reluctantly takes up the cause of civil rights but doesn't get anything through legislatively. LBJ, LBJ takes office in November and he realizes he can do something about it. This conversation happens with Martin Luther King on what was the second full day of LBJ's presidency, November 25th, 1963. LBJ has earlier that day attended the four-hour funeral of Kennedy. And he goes back that evening to the old executive office building that housed his vice president's office. He meets with foreign dignitaries and heads of state, some governors, and he makes a whole lot of phone calls. He calls governors, calls lawmakers, calls union leaders, calls business leaders. And in this case, he calls a 34-year-old civil rights leader named Martin Luther King at his home in Atlanta. And a good many people told me that they uh, heard about your statement, I guess, on TV, wasn't it? Yes, that's right. Uh, uh -huh. I, I've been locked up in this office and I haven't seen it, but I won't tell you how grateful I am and how, how worthy I'm going to try to be of all your hopes. Well, thank you very much. I'm so happy to hear that, and I knew that you had just that great spirit, and you know you have our support and backing. Well, because we know what a difficult period this is. It's, a, it's a just an impossible period. We've got a budget coming up. It's we got nothing to do with it. It's practically already made, and we've got a civil rights bill that hadn't even passed the House, and it's November, and Hubert Humphrey told me yesterday everybody wanted to go home. We've got a tax bill that they haven't touched, and we just uh, got to let up, not let up on any of them and keep going, and I guess they'll say that I'm repudiated, but I'm going to ask the Congress Wednesday to just stay there they pass them all. They won't do it, but we'll just keep them there next year till they do, and we just won't give up an inch. Uh -huh. Well, this is, this is mighty fine. I think it's, uh, it's so imperative. I think one of the great uh, tributes that we can pay in memory of President Kennedy is to try to enact some of the great uh, progressive policies that he sought to initiate. Well, I'm going to support them all, and you can count on that, and I'm going to do my best to get other men to do likewise, and I'll have to have y'all's help. I never needed more than I do now. Well, you know you have it, and just feel free to call on us for anything. Thank you so much, Mark. All right. Call me when you're to the family. I sure will. Call me when you're down here next time. I certainly will. But let's get together, and, and any suggestions you got, bring them in. Fine. I certainly will do that. Thank you so much. Thank you. And so begins one of the most important partnerships of the 20th century. You heard in that conversation LBJ say, I'm going to support them all, and you can count on that. 
and I'm going to ask other men to do likewise. And I never need you all's help more than I do now. But uh, King couldn't necessarily count on LBJ's support. Uh, any idea why? Thoughts? Why couldn't LBJ or King count on LBJ's support on civil rights? Because his, his sorry. Let's, well, yeah. Well, also, uh, LBJ's voting rights, a uh, voting uh, uh, record on civil rights was a mixed bag. We talked about the, those two earlier pieces of civil rights legislation, the 1957 Civil Rights Act and the 1960 Civil Rights Act. LBJ was an opponent of both of those pieces of legislation. Uh, he was probably the most powerful Senate majority leader of the 20th century and maybe in the history of the United States. Again, he, he was so uh, uh, knowledgeable about the legislative process. He was so smart when it came to how to get things done. And those two pieces of civil rights legislation were largely important because of their symbolism, because nothing had been done legislatively on civil rights since Reconstruction but they were also largely rendered toothless. And Johnson knew that if he tried to do something more, to do something that was potent, they would simply be defeated again. So he took them, he got them through, helped to get them through, and understood the power of them emblematically. But, so, so Martin Luther King doesn't know whether he truly has an ally in Lyndon Johnson or not. And Johnson proves very quickly that he does. Because three days later, Johnson goes before a joint session of Congress and gives his first full address to the nation in the wake of the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And he says to Congress, our slain president wanted a Civil Rights Act. Well, we're going to get a Civil Rights Act. Johnson realizes that he can use John F. Kennedy's martyrdom to pu push this through, to get something through that might not normally be able to be passed. He doesn't let a good crisis go to waste. And so he calls up lawmakers and says, no, 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 you have to do this for John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy gave his life for this nation. You need to do this. And so after the filibuster that was talked about by the panel earlier, Johnson gets it done. My favorite story, actually, I'm going to hold that. I'm going to hold that until the next slide. Uh, so there, there's this burgeoning partnership between LBJ and Martin Luther King. I mentioned that voting rights got stripped out of the Civil Rights Act. But LBJ realizes that in 1965, he might have an opportunity to get voting rights through. But he realizes that he needs the movement. Uh, Don talked about the movement earlier and, and how important it was to have mostly African-American people on the front lines showing Americans the racial injustice that was common in certain parts of this country. LBJ meets with Martin Luther King and John Lewis, among others, in 1964 after the Civil Rights Act is passed. And they press him on voting rights. And Johnson said, I don't have the power. I don't have the power to give you voting rights right now. You need to give me the power. You need to, you need to find a way for me to seize political capital. Give me the power to to get this through. So as they're leaving, John Lewis asks Dr. King, so what do we do now? And Martin Luther King says, we got to give him the power. And they do. And you can hear in this conversation, which is my favorite of all of the tapes of the, of the, the 643 hours of conversations, you can hear Johnson egging Martin Luther King on, encouraging him to get people out there on the front lines of the movement and to get the media to pay attention. And you'll, you'll hear uh, 
you'll hear what I think is a remarkable partnership very clearly in this conversation, conversation about voting rights. LBJ, I believe he's in Canada for the day, meeting with Lester Pearson, the Prime Minister. It was January 15th, 1965, Martin Luther King's birthday, and LBJ calls King to wish him a happy birthday and to plot strategy. When we get these, these big things through that we need, Medicare, education, I've already got that hearing started the 22nd in the House, 26th in the Senate. Your people ought to be very, very uh, 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 diligent in looking at those committee members that uh, come from urban areas that are friendly to you to see that those bills get reported right out because uh, you have no idea, it's shocking to you, uh, how much benefits uh, uh, they will get. Uh, there's eight billion five hundred million this year for education, compared to seven hundred million when I started. Uh, so you can imagine, uh, you can imagine uh, what effort that's going to be. And this one bill is a billion and a half. Now, if we can get that, and we can get a Medicare, we ought to get that by February. Uh, then uh, uh, we get our poverty. Uh, that will be more than double what it was last year. Then we've got to come up with the uh, uh, qualification of the voters. That will answer 70% of your problems. That's right. If you just clear it out everywhere, make it age and read and write. No tests on uh, uh, what Chaucer said or, or Browning's poetry or constitutions or or memorizing or anything else. Johnson goes on, what he's talking about are the, the poll tests that were being used to prevent African Americans from voting. There were also poll taxes. What he goes on to say in this conversation is you need to get your folks out there. You need to go to the worst places in the South and you need to get the TV cameras there. And you need to get them in the get the newspaper folks there and the radio folks. And if you do that, if you show Americans the worst of voter oppression, and this is a direct quote from LBJ, he says, there isn't a fellow who drives a tractor who won't say that isn't right. That isn't fair. He knew that Americans wouldn't abide by that if they saw it firsthand. And that's exactly what happens in Selma. In Selma, Alabama, there was a, uh, a march planned from, from Selma to Alabama's capital, Montgomery, and it's brutally thwarted by Alabama state troopers in a day of infamy that became known as Bloody Sunday. Happened to be a night when the sound of music was being played on television. So a, practically a record number of Americans were tuning in to the sound of music. And they see that program interrupted by a report from Selma, Alabama, showing the bloody events that have transpired down there. So there's this, the conscience of a nation is outraged at what happens. And again, LBJ seizes the moment. He goes before a joint session of Congress once again and makes televised remarks in which, among other things, he makes the remarks that you heard earlier about being a school teacher and how he aims to use the power of the presidency to exact justice. And he says, what happens in Selma um, is a reflection of what's happening in, in, in the African American experience. He says, uh, I want to get this quote right because it's vitally important. He says, uh, I don't remember the quote, so I'm going to bastardize it. I don't want to do that. But he says that racial injustice has hit every corner of this country, and we shall overcome. We must overcome the, the racial injustice, or we won't meet our promise as a nation. By invoking that phrase, we shall overcome, 
He's essentially invoking the anthem of the civil rights movement, which was being heard in protest marches across the country. I mentioned John Lewis and Martin Luther King, who happened to be watching that speech in Selma, where they were regrouping to once again do that march from Selma to Montgomery. Dr. King hears LBJ say those words, we shall overcome, and tears start flowing from his eyes. And he says, we shall march from Selma to Montgomery. The Voting Rights Act will pass. And that's exactly what happens. The Voting Rights Act passes. LBJ uses that crisis to get it through. Three years later, Martin Luther King is assassinated in Memphis, and LBJ uses that moment to get through the Fair Housing Act. Not quite as potent, not quite as transformative as the Civil Rights Act of 1964 or the Voting Rights Act of 1965, but again, important in its symbolism and one unfinished piece of civil rights business that LBJ can get off of his agenda. He uses those three tragedies to help us to fulfill our promise. Earlier this year, I think we saw the tipping point of LBJ's legacy. I mentioned that he was remembered principally for Vietnam. And again, I don't dispute that that is a fair part of LBJ's legacy. But I'm confident that in 100 years, when school children are learning about the 20th century, that they'll learn about the civil rights movement in the same way that kids today look back at the 1800s and learn about the Civil War. The Vietnam War was a tragedy, but it won't be significant historically as years pass. And I think LBJ was finally recognized for his heroism in civil rights back in April when, at the LBJ Presidential Library, we convened a civil rights summit that brought, among others, three former presidents and President Barack Obama to the library to talk about LBJ's courage and fortitude. Uh, here's a clip from a film that we have at the library on civil rights with this new postscript based on the proceedings of the civil rights summit. Nearly two generations later, four presidents came to the LBJ Library for a civil rights summit to take stock of where we are today and to reflect upon Johnson's role in civil rights. Lyndon Johnson came along with his great uh, insight and political courage and literally changed my personal life and the life of everyone that lived in America. Just as Abraham Lincoln stewarded the 13th Amendment through Congress, Johnson's leadership embodies the power of the presidency to redeem the promise of America. Through these efforts, LBJ earned the highest compliment a democracy can provide. He made us one people. Because of the civil rights movement, because of the laws President Johnson signed, new doors of opportunity and education swung open for everybody. They swung open for you, and they swung open for me. And that's why I'm standing here today, because of those efforts, because of that legacy. And if our efforts continue, and if our will is strong, and if our hearts are right, and if courage remains our constant companion, then, my fellow Americans, I am confident we shall overcome. That last clip was also at the LBJ Presidential Library in what was LBJ's very last public address. It's the last things he said publicly. He made public appearances after that, but a month later he was dead. And he had convened his own civil rights symposium in 1972 and provided the keynote address. And I think sort of prophetically uh, sort of articulated his own legacy in that speech. I mentioned that everyone has a great 
story about LBJ. And my very, very favorite story relates to the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. LBJ came up in the House and Senate uh, under the, uh, uh, with the good graces of many Southern senators. Among them was Richard Russell, the great senator from Georgia. Russell was uh, a friend and mentor to, to LBJ, but also a, an opponent, a fierce opponent of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. He's one of the ones who stages that filibuster that, that, that we talked about earlier. But out of respect for Russell, Johnson invites him to the Oval Office to tell him that he's determined to pass the act. And he's not going to let anything get in his way. So he brings him to the Oval Office, sits him down. He says, uh, Dick, I love you and I owe you. But I'm going to pass the Civil Rights Act. And you're going to oppose it. And I'm here to tell you I'm going to run over you. I'm just giving you fair warning that this is going to happen. We're going to take it all this time. We're finally going to do something of meaning. But, but I want you to be, be given fair warning. It's going to happen at your expense. Russell hears out Johnson, and he says, well, Mr. President, I think you can do that. I don't think Jack Kennedy could have done it, but I, I think you can. But I will warn you, if you do, you will risk losing the party in the South to the Republicans, and you will risk losing the presidency in your own right in the election later this year. And Johnson, this great creature of power, a man who spent his practically his entire adult life toward the acquisition and exercise of power, hears Russell and replies, Dick, if that is the price for this bill, I will gladly pay it. That's remarkable political courage. I wrote in, in Indomitable Will in the, uh, in the introduction that those who knew LBJ would say he was great. Flawed, yes, and not always good, but great. And that story, I think, as much as anything, is a reflection of Lyndon Johnson's greatness. Thank you very much.